Yeah, hey everybody, thanks for the introduction. A um, few words about myself. I started my PhD in Germany um, two years ago, and this talk is pretty much about the industrialized version of my PhD thesis. Um, a lot of work was also done by Mark Kaminsky, um, who really pushes things forward but is not here today. Yeah, so uh, the talk is going to be Next Generation Car Workshop Diagnostics at BMW. Um, it's probably one of the topics you can do with data at an automotive brand, aside from um, probably autonomous driving and checking if your factory is, is doing what it should. Um, so I want to start with a, questions, uh, with, with a question. If you ever brought your car to a dealership and they failed to identify and eliminate uh, your problem with the first try, so you had to get your car back to the dealership and like let them work over the same issue again. Who ever had that problem? <laughs> yeah, right, so that is probably one of the biggest reasons, because um, we want to provide more accurate and fast help to customers turning in their car into our dealerships. And there are potential of root causes that kind of make this a little bit hard. So uh, the first thing is that cars are getting more and more complex today. We have like, um, for example, hybridization, where you basically pack two different drivetrains into the car, a standard combust combustion engine along with a um, electrical engine. Also, we have increased connectivity, not only in the car, but also between cars. Um, then we have, on the other hand, less experienced workshop staff, especially in the evolving markets. Not everywhere on the world, it's like in Germany, where you have to go through a multi-year education before you are allowed to work in dealership as a mechanic. Um, and then the third point, and that is the point we want to tackle with our system, is that you have static workshop diagnostics. And that basically means that the guy who develops the control unit that is built into the car, for example, for the combustion engine, and thinks of potential issues that could arise during operation while actually building the unit. So it's quite clear that this approach can cope with the vast number of um, probabilities or possibilities that could arise, for example, if the car is operated in Africa versus the car is operated in um, Russia, completely different um, environmental conditions. So the idea is to shift away from this manually generated approach to a more data-driven approach. And if we uh, think back to the, or, or if you think about how it's done right now, the expert developing the control unit comes up with a basically manually generated decision tree that where every um, branch is a check that is performed in the workshop when the car is there for service. And the leaves of the tree are kind of the parts that you can switch in your car to like get your car repaired. And we want, what we want to do with our approach is to eliminate the whole tree and like point directly to the leaves. Um, and we want to do that based on data. So um, we eliminate the workshop staff or enhance the workshop staff. And we use a, an artificial intelligence and feed this with the data generated by the cars and in the workshops. So how does our data basically look? Um, BMW just announced uh, last week uh, the BMW car data that basically enables every customer that signed up for a connected drive to look into the data that the car collects during driving. And we use that data to train our model. And what's that? For example, we have diagnostic trouble codes that is um, based on the self-diagnostic capabilities of your car. Your car has models like some measurement values should behave. And if the difference between the measured value and the model value um, gets too large, it kind of flags a trouble code, meaning that the car itself recognized that something is wrong. So we can use those trouble codes to, to model. Um, aside from that, we have measurement values that basically tell us how the car was used. For example, um, how many times the second gear was used or how many times you shifted from the third to the second gear or which operating temperatures the engine had during your drive cycles. Um, 
and we have many more values. Um, so what is also different is that we are pretty much data agnostic. So as soon as a new data source is available, we could use that data as well to model, um, to do better predictions based on the data. Um, so how does it work? Every time your car gets into a workshop, it's kind of um, plugged in. Usually it's not done using a cable, but for the sake of this animation, it's done with a cable. And then um, there are a couple of measurement values, diagnostic trouble codes um, generated in a key value fashion. Um, we also have, aside from that, for example, car parameters that tell us the software version that is in the car. And we also have the workshop protocols that tell us which cars were, were switched. And so one, one, what we want to predict is, um, for example, the parts that need to be switched. For example, uh, if something broke in your car, um, and we have probably a measurement value telling us that there is a part that needs to be switched. But um, in some cases, an action is also enough. Um, for example, to flash a new firmware onto your control unit. And a combination of both, um, along with some checks that need, to, uh, that need to be performed, is a complete workshop protocol. And we can also predict these. Um, but as always, uh, the data, like we had extract them from our databases, is not the right format to do, to, uh, to do machine learning. And that is where our pipeline kicks in. Um, yeah, and that is pretty much the point where we start using Spark. So what, we, what you see here is kind of an overview over the pi pipeline we have right now. Um, we start on the left, and throughout the presentation, we will move to the right. And what you probably notice is that the arrows are getting thinner and thinner on the way from the left to the right, meaning that the amount of data is decreased. So we start with a traditional relational database um, on the left. We extract the data. Um, we extract the data because we use all the available data uh, for one car. Um, and we don't want to do this every day to cause unnecessary load on the database. Therefore, we do only one complete dump and then uh, delta loads um, afterwards. Then we start transforming the data. And um, the first, first buffer is only, we call it sophisticated buffering format. Some people might know it under CSV. Um, so the, the first buffer is pretty simple. And the second buffer is already some kind of um, par compressed parquet just to save space. Um, and we use the data from the second buffer to train uh, models using MLlib. And then we serialize those models to disk again. Uh, the, the first thing is the model data itself, but that is accompanied by, by some metadata that let us allow to assess the model quality later on. Um, also, um, some transformers, like for example, a string indexer, are um, estimators, as Spark calls it. Um, that means they need to be trained on the data, and that is why they also need to be serialized um, into the model uh, storage um, to be able to use that pipeline later on. Yeah, and the last thing is that we serve this models um, to an end user interface. So um, let's take a deeper, deeper dive into the transformation layer. Um, the first thing is we do the extraction using, um, we call it extended SQL. That is just a simple language that embeds into standard SQL and that helps us to generate subqueries and programmatically from standard queries. And the basic idea is to offload computational complexity from the database to our own server. Um, what you see here is a little example that will, for example, generate uh, 10 subqueries and it will say that between one and nine instead of querying all 100 IDs at once. And since it's embedded in a standard SQL um, command, this will not affect any standard uh, SQL compiler. So it's, this query will still run on a standard compiler. And then we have the transformation itself. Um, we do feature engineering using UDFs. There are a couple of uh, columns or, or uh, data points that we need to transform. Um, the first one is, for example, that we have the dealer location, but it's um, perfectly possible that a dealer has a number of, for example, 70,000 is located in Germany, and a dealer with a number of 70,001 is located in Russia. So um, 
that doesn't make any sense, so we use an UDF to transform dealership numbers into um, GPS coordinates. And another thing is the string indexing we do. That could be, for example, the position of the steering wheel, because um, in some strange countries on the world, they drive on the wrong side and have the steering wheel on the other side. And we still make the need that information accessible to the model. And then we have the transformation. Um, the transformation is like the key value pair into a, I guess most of you do also machine learning. So we need to transform that into a format where every feature has basically its own column. Um, and that is one of the major reasons why we, were, uh, we, why we switched to Spark, because um, that is really one of the most computational complex tasks uh, where other frameworks fail or are much, much slower. So once our data is transformed, it kind of looks like that. Of course, that is pretty much simplified, but um, one thing that is, is not um, on this slide is that we have huge number of dimensions. So um, if we wouldn't reduce our data in terms of the number of dimensions, we would end up with uh, 25,000 dimensions and more. Um, but after filtering, we still end up with 5,000. So this number of dimensions is, is even hard to, um, to work with uh, on Spark since um, the direct acyclic graph or DAG that is generated um, uses the plain column names um, every time you do a transformation using the column. So and if you do multiple transformations with your columns, the column names appear more often in this graph. So, so you pretty much um, hitting like a Java virtual machine restrictions with it. So aside from the high, dimensional, uh, high dimensionality, you notice that we have a heterogeneous feature space. So we have basically everything that is possible. Uh, we have ints, floats, strings, um, booleans, everything. Um, we have a very high sparsity. Um, I told you about the trouble codes that are flagged when a car notices that something is wrong and to kind of let the BMW's engineers debug uh, that incident, uh, we usually print um, some surrounding um, parameters um, to, the, to the memory of the car. For example, if you have a problem related to the engine, you will most likely have the runs per minute the engine did uh, when that error occurred. So it's kind of like a stack trace for the combustion engine engineers. Um, but these surrounding conditions only uh, are available if the error occurred. And since the error doesn't occur very often, we have like a very sparse data set. So in some cases, we have a sparsity of up to 99.9%. Um, also, we have a very high class imbalance. Um, that is due to the fact that when we have 200,000 workshop protocols, it's perfectly possible that a, a part, for example, that we want to model was only switched about 100 times. So we have huge class imbalance. And then the last thing is we have no negative, ne uh, no negative readouts or workshop sessions. So and there is no designated um, sample in the data that tells us how a okay car looks, so a car without any issues. Um, most of the samples that are in the database are because the data had an issue or the customer thought uh, that the car had an issue, which was more a design, um, design error. Yeah, once we have the data, we get into modeling. Uh, modeling itself is pretty straightforward to do with Spark and MLlib. Um, so I want to focus um, on the serializing we did because that is kind of the crux of the matter in my understanding if you want to take your models into production. Um, you need to make sure that you don't have to retrain the model every time your uh, server restarts. Um, so we split uh, the model data into um, two stages. Um, the first stage is everything that is independent on the model itself. So everything that is correlated to preparation, for example, string indexing, um, label indexing, um, assembling the vector to train the model, and so on and so forth. And the second stage is anything that is dependent on the model. That could be a vector indexer that you are able to apply a random forest. Of course, the model itself, the random forest, uh, or a logistic regression. Um, 
And aside from the applicability of the first stage independent of the second stage, we ran into another issue with Spark um, that the code generation fails, exceeding some um, esoteric um, Java virtual machine uh, limits. There is a pull request, but that hasn't been merged yet. But until that pull request is merged, um, yeah, we have to split it. So, and the second thing is the metadata uh, that we use to um, kind of as let the user assess the quality of the model. So, the information contained by the metadata is partly redundant to the uh, information in the model data, but since metadata is stored as JSON, um, you don't have to spin up a Spark context to assess that information. So, and the last thing about modeling I want to point out is um, we are kind of forced to do that since we're having a very huge feature space. But even if you don't, that might become handy for you. Um, we did some feature reduction. There are a couple of techniques uh, we use. Uh, the first one is chi-squared, which is also implemented by the Spark core natively. And we enhanced that with a couple of techniques we implemented by ourselves. Um, and for example, the correlation is just using uh, the statistics a class from um, MLibstat. But um, the training time not only decreases if you do feature selection, but also the AOC increases. Uh, so the model quality goes up and the training time goes down, um, which is pretty nice. Yeah, the last thing we want to do is we want to serve the gained insights to a um, user. Um, we put up a simple backend together um, that is built with uh, Spark and the Play framework. Um, I guess a lot of you know Node.js, and I would say that the Play framework is basically um, the Scala version of Node.js for JavaScript. And the front end was implemented using AngularJS and Bootstrap. Um, and this interface can be used by workshop staff and BMW engineers alike. Um, the interface is used by BMW engineers to kind of double check what happened in the workshop. It, that kind of aligns with the data we, we collected. And the workshop staff um, is using the interface to kind of guess, get a second, um, get a second um, yeah, information of what to do with the car at hand. So the workshop is uh, trying that out in a, a prototype um, phase. So let's take a deeper look, a uh, closer look at the, um, at the interface. It's pretty simple, um, but uh, it serves its uh, purpose. Um, on the top right, you have uh, the possibility to um, search for a vehicle identification number or a readout ID. A readout ID is generated every time a car is being plugged in at the workshop and data is pushed from the, the car. Um, then you can choose multiple readouts of the specific vehicle if you want to compare and see if things are coming up or, or not. And then you get a list of potential faults or countermeasures uh, that are ranked by the model output. Yeah, so um, that's basically our pipeline. Um, now I want to point out some of the pitfalls we had. Um, when I was attending my first Spark seminar, I was just getting started with Spark, and I would have been very thankful to receive a pitfalls list. So maybe that be of help for at least some of you. Um, so the first one is that if you have a vast number of columns, um, like I said, really do um, some feature subset selection or transformation techniques like PCA that will really boost your performance and stability. Um, the second thing is that there are some pieces of code that run just fine if you um, submit your application using the standard sub Spark Submit, but will not run um, if you launch the um, same code from the IDE using the debugger. And that is kind of strange because all the unit tests will be passing since you usually don't launch them directly from the IDE, but um, somehow the code just doesn't return what's expected to do. So what we recommend is that if you um, like doing serious debugging, you should definitely uh, launch your application using Spark Submit and then attach your debugger afterwards to it and don't use, for example, IntelliJ to like launch your um, Spark 
program directly from the um, debugger or development studio. So this, the third uh, thing is watch your logs. We had some cases where we um, tested using a very small data set. Um, so the data set was only 2 MB uh, megabytes large, um, but it costs over 100 uh, gigabytes of log during just a couple of hours. And that is not only wasting your disk space, but also bottlenecking all the rest of the pipeline's performance. So you should definitely um, take a look at your configurations folder and make sure that your uh, logging settings are right. Um, I think the standard setting is info, and that is probably a little bit too detailed. Um, and the fourth th uh, thing is to get your number of petitions right. So um, most of us, usually when they start using Spark, will start with loading, for example, a CSV in. And that CSV usually has only one partition. Um, and having a larger number of partition, partitions is crucial for Spark to be able to parallelize. So what you will do usually is you use the uh, repartition method to set some higher number of partitions, for example, matching the number of cores. Um, we did just that, and especially for the transformation step I just mentioned, um, we really had to set a huge number of partitions um, to get this step to work. But afterwards, um, there are some steps where this number of partitions was too high. So there's a rule of uh, thumb saying if one tasks, and you should watch closely on the Spark UI, if one task takes less than 100 milliseconds, you're probably using too much partitions. Um, and I brought two screenshots from the Spark UI. Um, what you see here is um, the, the first bar is basically showing um, what, uh, how Spark spends its computation time. And want, what you want to maximize is the green end of the bar, because that's the actual computation. Anything else is basically overhead. And if we only use two partitions, um, we end up with a computation time of about 10%. And the total time of this stage is 82 milliseconds. But if we would have used um, the number of partitions that we used for string indexing, um, so that were 1,120 partitions, the amount of computation time is approximately only 1%. And not only that, the number of the, the proportion of comp computational time is much slower, uh, much lower. Um, we also need more um, tasks to complete this stage. So the total time for this stage, it's the complete same um, step, is 4,000 milliseconds. So uh, the Spark UI says four seconds. So um, it's really important to know that um, probably setting the number of partitions only once when you kind of start your application is not the right way to go. But uh, you should keep in mind that there are some scenarios where lowering the number of partitions can also increase your performance. So you should definitely keep an eye on your Spark UI during your um, application. Yeah, and the last thing is the, would you mind to postpone that question to the, thank you. Um, the last thing is the tool chain. We kind of spent some time um, figuring out what the right tool chain for our use case is. And we would recommend you using Ubuntu and not Windows for development, because it's less hacky, especially with all the Hadoop correlated stuff. Um, we recommend IntelliJ, because it really has great integration with Scala, and therefore Spark. Um, it has a great uh, version control system integration. Um, and, we, and that's kind of the last point. We didn't try out Python or any other languages. What, we just went for Scala, uh, Scala, and it worked very well. We like the functional paradigm with fold left, fold right, and um, it just har harmonizes well with uh, Spark. When you get error messages, you can actually make sense of them. Yeah. To conclude, um, Spark is a great way for crunching large data sets once you know, got to know the pitfalls. We have a couple of um, next steps that we want to implement. Um, we want to roll out our code to a larger cluster. Um, right now, we're using our model only for hybrid cars. So if we want to roll that out for the whole fleet of cars, we will definitely uh, need more computational resources. Um, we want to implement um, more filter methods to reduce the feature space. 
And what's missing right now to Spark, um, maybe that prayer will be heard by next year's Spark Summit, are um, techniques to cope with imbalanced data sets like Smulti or Addison. Um, and we also need to come up with uh, some strategies to deal with missing values. And then we want to take a look at Spark streaming. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention and time. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Otherwise, I will be on the conference for the rest of the day. Um, the Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of, uh, would you mind, do we have a microphone? I'm not sure, hello? I'm not sure why the partitions are two, and the computation time is 10%. And when the partitions increase, the, the compute time decreased. Um, so the computation time in person is like only the proportion that's happening. And the problem is if you have too many partitions, you kind of increase the overhead of communicating between the, the threads. Or is that the question? You said the total time is 82 milliseconds. Yes. And then it increased when you increase the number of partitions. Yes. Why the comp computation time did not increase? It decreased. Oh, ah, From no, I got you. The, the computation time. Um, the, so, the, so you mean the, uh, do I have a laser? Yeah. You mean this value compared to this value? Yes. Ah, OK, gotcha. So um, this value is the, ah, so th this is uh, another scale than this. It's just a screenshot taken from, from Spark. So these two uh, x-axis scales doesn't match up. And the reason is um, this computation time, the 10% the, the is um, corresponding to the green proportion of the complete bar. So the green proportion, so the, the, the proportion where the extra computation takes place, takes up 10% of the total time in this case. And in this case, the green proportion, it's barely um, like not noticeable. But in this case, the green proportion only takes up 1% of the complete computation. Except the complete computation is longer. The, 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 the complete computation in the second case is longer. It's 4,000. No, um, this is only like the visualization of one um, task. And in this case, we have like 1,120 tasks to complete the complete stage. Uh, we'll you, you might want to grab me later on. Yes, we'll, Would that we'll be? take it. Cool, moment. okay. I, uh, so you said in that uh, your pipeline, you serialize the models and then you use it outside to serve them. Yeah. So did you use any libraries specifically to load this model and serve them outside Spark? No, that's uh, a still a prayer we have for the next year's Spark conference to enable to deserialize model without a Spark context. Okay. So um, oh, that are going to be a couple of slides. Um, our server uh, still, whoop. Okay. Our server still has like a small Spark context okay. that is not as mighty as the Spark context we use for training the models, but still you need to have a Spark context for deserializing the, your models. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. But I heard that there is a jar from Databricks that yes, you can so, use. So they had a talk that they have developed something so that you can deserialize these models and use it outside in a Java application. Yeah. So, but but that, they haven't open sourced it. They were just giving a demo that's with Databricks. Yeah. And they plan to show it. So that's what I wanted. Like, do and you another, another problem is that this jar doesn't work as, so, as soon as you implemented your own pipeline stages, which we did. So it wouldn't work for our case. No, I'm saying that jar was to deserialize the model. So you can generate the model using the MLlib, yeah. and then offline, take that model, load it up into a JVM, and use it directly. So you can just call the scoring function of them. Uh, yeah, that would be the best case scenario. Yes. But right now, you still need a Spark context. OK. OK, thanks. Thank you.
Hi. Hi. I was wondering uh, why do you prefer to use MLlib and not Spark ML? Um, why did we use to prefer? To use MLlib yeah. and not Spark ML. Um, that's pretty much a decision we made because we just wanted to use the most um, current um, version of, of Spark. And since like everything which is not data set correlated is marked as not depreciated, but um, like data set is the way to go. And that's why we used uh, the most current version. But we didn't, as a, the performance doesn't differ. It's just a matter of the API you are using. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, the question I have is for the features that you guys extracted. So you initially said that you had around 25,000 features. Yeah. And then you extracted 5,000 out of them. Yeah. So did you use some manual approach, or how did you figure out what pro features should we select? Um, so basically three things. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is that um, with the BMW data, you kind of have a lot of um, um, multi-dimensional things, for example, how many times the, the engine uh, was in which, which temperature. And we kind of use uh, custom approaches to reduce, let's say, this 10-dimensional data to a one-dimensional data point that tells us what, what the average temperature, for example, was in the simplest form. Um, the other thing is that we use some standard filters like correlation just to remove um, uh, features that had a very high correlation with other features. And if you have like a 95% correlation between two, two features, you can probably drop one of the features and wouldn't lose any, um, any, any information. And we kind of stored that information and used that. So we didn't do that all the time. We kind of settled um, before setting, out, uh, setting up the pipeline on the 5,000 features we wanted to use. And the, the steps I just mentioned were only done once. OK. Uh, another question that I have yeah. is basically, when you say workshop car diagnostic, uh, does it mean the data that is collected before the car was put into the d workshop, or is like the data collected during the testing for workshops? Um, both. Uh, so we have the data that is collected during uh, you driving your car. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that one. Then we have data that is um, that is created in the workshop, for example, if they perform tests or if they switch parts, which, uh, which is also basically data. So it's kind of a mixture of everything we can get. OK. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, my question is, um, after you reduce to 5,000 features, did, did you get good results with the ML? It seems like still, and with the data, is still somewhat sparse at that point, right? Yeah. So it's hard to get good results with sparse data. I mean, did you have any insights to that or special things you did? Yeah, there were plenty of cases we, where we just said, OK, we can't do any, build any successful models in this case. Um, but after applying our filters, um, we kind of ended up mostly with about 10 to 100 important features. And we achieved AOC values at about 0 0.9 for many, many models. So um, that actually is possible. So our proof of concept definitely says that this concept is proven. Um, but there are plenty of cases where it's just not working. Yeah. And the interesting question that still is in the room is how you kind of define what data you would need to have to be able to build my, better models in the, in the future. But um, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, and another question was, um, are you doing anything with the data to predict future failure rather than existing failure? Um, so that is the next step for us. Um, we're just having um, kind of the, the challenge there are no problems, only challenges. Um, I might draw it with a laser pointer. You have like a lot of uh, values that go like that. And once your error occurs or occurred, they kind of um, like uh, there is no linear uh, relation between the, the value and the error occurring. And we have many values like that. So um, where we are able to build predictive models we would first have to assess the, the features and their compatibility or 
usability for, for predictive analytics. But basically, um, everything we did so far um, can be hopefully ported into doing predictive analytics. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. Oh, one more question. Yeah, one last question. That's more on the car itself. So how did you determine that the solution that you suggested is correct? Meaning, like, I suggest this part's failure, you replace this part and actually fix the problem. Very good question. Um, so that is one of the basic um, yeah, requirements we had for our systems. So we say that if you bring your car to the dealership and they replace the wrong car, you will show up again. Um, and you will show up again until they did the right thing with your car. So in, in, if you look at the data at a whole, uh, the cases where the right thing was did um, is always the dominant case in the database. Does that make sense? Because you will be showing up until the issue is fixed, and the issue will only be fixed um, if you if, if the right thing was done to your car. And we kind of came up with a few heuristics. For example, we penalize um, workshop sessions that let a customer to um, return within a short period of time. And so we don't use that ones for training. We only use the ones where we have, according to our heuristic, where there is a high probability that this was actually the right thing to do in that moment. Okay, thank you, Bernard. Um